like to welcome you to our uh, Experts at Home series, and I am really excited today to be talking to my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Mance, uh, a psychiatrist here in Santa Barbara, but who also uh, sees people all over the world, actually. Um, and I really am excited, Michael, to hear and get a chance to talk to you about you know how people are feeling in this very uh, difficult time. So the first question I wanted to ask you is just kind of, what are you seeing in your practice um, in terms of what people are dealing with right now? It's, it's a great question. I mean, there's a variety. Um, there's a small group that actually does is doing pretty well. They've kind of learned how to de develop a kind of a, a retreat lifestyle and really enjoying uh, the simplicity of such a lifestyle. So that's always a refreshing thing. I wish that was the majority of people that I was seeing, but at least I wanna highlight that there is a possibility where you can take advantage of a situation like that, learning how to maybe slow down, how to create routines. And those people, just to use those as models, they generally have they, a couple of them, a large percentage put up something of like routines things for them to do a couple have actually gone to like putting gold stars for themselves on there and i'll tell you the people who are doing these sort of tangible things have really seemed to flourish much more than i would say the other people who where it's very difficult they've they've been so introduced into uh having some sort of schedule for them but when that sort of opened up it gets sort of chaotic and they start to kind of fall off a lot of the things that generally make them healthy so Go now using that as a segue. That's what I've seen in a lot of people uh, with people I've been working with, both you know clinically and then just noticing again friends and loved ones too who are also obviously struggling in all of this. And and I see a lot of uh, first I saw it came in waves when the um, when sort of the the shelter in place order started to come in place. It activated a very primal circuit of panic because we were getting disconnected, and that disconnected activated this sort of um, I, I really refer a lot to. Uh, are you familiar with Yak Pankcep's work, uh, Neuroaffective Science? Yeah. yeah. I'm very much influenced by his idea. And I think the panic grief system that really kind of encapsulates a lot of the issues that a lot of people. So I felt it in myself. I mean, there's a kind of a, a surge of, of adrenaline. It was kind of like an up uh, step in, in all of us. And so those of us who were kind of ready teetering on like anxiety to the level or depression to the level where it's going to impair one's function, uh, it kind of cross that threshold pretty readily. So I did see a, a spike in suicidal ideation. Um, in our clinic, uh, we we do use um, ketamine treatment and for that. So we had, we wound up using a little bit more of that to try to help. Because at that time, we weren't sure whether we were going to um, kind of supersede our healthcare capacity. We didn't sure we weren't sure how how safe LA or something was going to get hit, which could then of course led to more people coming up to cottage and whatnot. So we wanted to, in, as a physician, I felt and our job on the front line was try to limit how many people that we would have to go to the hospital, potentially overwhelming the system and really trying to save those people. So in that situation, we would have to do the appropriate precautions and I would see people. So panic was a big one. Uh, suicidal ideation did increase in a lot of people uh, where also the difficulty lied is in, in an addiction. Addiction became much more difficult because they didn't have their 12 step, they didn't have their groups, at least for a while. It took a while for people to shift the tables a little bit and learn how to adapt. So that that created a lot of problems. So I, a lot of people uh, lapsed in, 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 you know, in the clinics that, uh, not for me, but not in my clinic and also for other people that I know who also run, I have a couple colleagues too who uh, emphasize and work a lot with uh, addiction uh, clients. So I would say those would be the kind of major areas that I would say, and we could always piece that apart if you wanted to. Mm. No, I, I've i definitely seen that too with the real uptick in anxiety and mm -hmm. sometimes it taking other forms, but like you said, that disconnection from mm -hmm. others, um, you know, it's hard on a lot of people um, and even hard on people who were kind of entering out and trying to do more. Yes. <laughs> now all of a sudden you have to stay, you know, yes. in. you know, it's one thing when they were choosing, it feels really different to have a rule. Yeah. The other thing I saw is a lot of people who've had past trauma that mm -hmm. somehow they kind of triggered a lot of things for them. Yeah. Um, I think partly because it's kind of like this invisible enemy that's out to get us and we mm -hmm. you don't know when the trouble's going to happen and, you know, all that uncertainty. Yeah. And you just kind of prompted something else for it, too, as well. Like you're saying that past trauma, again, an issue where the psyche itself is sort of has a, a fragmentation aspect and it's about reconnecting and reintegrating. And of course, when 
we, we tend to think we're for, sort of like see like our, our sense of self is sealed within the confines of our body but it's not it is an it is an ongoing transactional nature with our ecology you know whether it's the informational ecology that we're in or whether it's our direct environment and the people around us so people you know who often get either traumatized or they get that high kind of sensitized they become much more attuned with their environment in that way and so that could easily reflect and have a corresponding effect when that's not doing so well there's like i mean we all feel it. anybody who's an empath like a strongly connected person can obviously feel a little bit of unease in the body when it would be hard not to be not to feel especially even with the most current circumstances that are going on as well and then to lead that into another segue would be uh, like obsessive compulsive disorders that in particular were very uh, hard hit in this as well because obviously with that hand washing I mean, you know, a lot of the questions I would ask okay you know obviously you want to be doing it to the degree that's safe but then obviously they were already going kind of way overboard on that in the first place and people putting all kinds of toxic chemicals uh, burning their hands uh, these kind of things so we had to deal a lot in that area as well yeah yeah I've seen that too and that that's really it's a hard thing because it's like you know it's almost like see I was right to do all the damage. correct it, 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 it collaborates a belief you know absolutely yeah yeah um you know one of the th thing I wanted to ask you about in particular is you know you have sort of a different approach to psychiatry than a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. at least that I've experienced working with where you know it's just like a very medical model of just take this pill to treat this symptom and if that causes side effects let's add another pill to treat that symptom and mm -hmm. you know um you know what i've seen with you and your approach in your clinic is a much more holistic approach mm -hmm. um, of the person getting a healthy lifestyle together first of all mm -hmm. how that affects their mental health and i was wondering if you'd be willing to talk about that a bit because i think it's a really important thing and i've seen how much valuable it's been to people uh, that I've worked with that have worked with you, but also to others. Yeah, there, there's a lot of layers to that, you know, and I, I think uh, one of the things is that, you know, when we're trained in medical school, we're trained under the medical model, which is predominantly mechanistic. And we look at the body as a machine that, and oftentimes uh, when we're, uh, especially in our second year, we haven't learned any clinical experience, so we're only studying uh, all the things, all the millions and millions of possible things that can go wrong with your body. And it, and it brings, a, it immediately changes your perception. Since I've, I've had some work prior to, so I can actually notice my own perception starting to shift, where it starts to be, it's like us, it's like, like the model of, of the Western model is like us versus nature and us versus the body. Like where the body breaks down, we need to fix it. Just like a mechanic going over there and fixing the body. So that's kind of, driven into us and that's not, no wonder why a lot of us in our second year oftentimes and there's been studies to show that often a lot of med students when they're studying for their their step one boards when we're learning all this stuff will uh go to the hospital frequently with panic thinking they have like these horrible diseases because it's completely out of context they have no clinical experience but there's this beginning of the break of trust with the body and that, I think that's one of the biggest fundamental issues that is an issue with the Western medicine model is that it tends to look at the body as a machine and it tends to look at it as something to be fearful of. And I think oftentimes a lot of people have that fear and, it, 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 and, and lot, what I saw in my work, you know, and after, after personally going through a pretty intense um, kind of a psychobiological um, kind of issue myself during medical school because of my extreme a level of cognitive dissonance because I, I actually came into medical school with a, a degree in, in western herbalism so i was already on this sort of other side of the page in fact i was a little bit too far on the other side of the page as well like you know where you have this sort of dichotomy between what i would say is sort of like the the holistic side and sort of the western side but a lot of times they don't they don't integrate it's like you either have people open on this side like saying medicines are poison they're going to toxify you they, they kind of and all that stuff and then there's the other side where yeah or anything on on the uh, on the uh, on the holistic side is all there's no science to back it up it's all a bunch of bs it's all foo foo new agey stuff it's all placebo and so you have these two camps and and, and i felt very strongly having benefited from both to come up with more of an integrative model and i always felt it was very helpful to kind of conceptualize that was you know as you you uh, you're obviously very much aware is the biopsychosocial spiritual model and I found that to be a very 
good way to sort of uh, frame and conceptualize how to bring about well-being in a person's body. So just quickly, if that's if we look at the psychological part, I mean, the biological parts of the system, like how are you sleeping? How are you moving your body? Um, what your genetics are, if it's that that's necessary. You know, what kind of food are you putting inside your body? Because obviously, you know, 60%, if we're going to talk about the brain, is, is fat. And oftentimes we eat very toxic fat in our diets. A lot of times oxidized fats from being fried foods or eating just, you know, uh, all kinds of other fats that are just not healthy to the brain and functioning. So your brain's constantly trying to remodel itself. So if you're eating all these kind of toxic uh, materials, you're kind of, if you want to uh, re renovate your brain, which is, it's doing it constantly. Uh, you want to use the best materials. You don't want to use shoddy materials when it comes to your own brain. So that's one of the features that we go through. So that would be like the biological part. And then on the psychological part, because it's so important that we see that the mind and body is just a useful concept. It's not actually a separation of the two. It's, they're both two sides of the same coin. They both influence each other. And, and, and that idea that it's like all in your head is, is a very silly and very damaging idea. It's also in, completely incorrect and has been proven by science for well over, I would say over 20 years now. So I don't understand why even some of my own colleagues still share this kind of judgmental view on the body. So. We're looking at like automatic negative thoughts that tend to generate because when we go into chronic states of either anxiety or depression, you're often going to get thoughts that are just not the most accurate. They're either catastrophizing thoughts where you're thinking the absolute worst possible or I'm never going to get better or and it starts to create these beliefs like I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. I'm not, you know, I'm not worthy, which are very common when you get into these deep states. So we do also have to look at those as well. So that would be on the psychological. Then, of course, the social, as you probably as well know, and you're, you know, a lot of your people are watching how important we before we had this lockdown, we had the loneliness epidemic. So this was a. Uh, and it, what we call in medical is an acute on chronic condition. You know, you had a chronic condition of loneliness and we had an acute lockdown. That was like a double whammy for a system that was already having problems. And we know that a lot of well-being, I believe her name was Julianne Allstadt. She does a lot of research in this area and was comparing that, you know, with the amount of loss of social, um, you know, social connection is equivalent to that of, of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So you have these very profound impacts on our body, both mind and, and body as well. And then the final we would be spiritual, and that doesn't necessarily mean religious. It can be for different people, but really finding what is valuable and what is meaningful in your life and starting to become conscious of that so that you can align your current actions and behaviors in alignment to what is meaningful to you and obviously enrich your life by and by using those four areas. I found that to be a much more profound and, and helpful way to work with clients. And then also just to kind of highlight a lot of, you know, because the old model of psychiatry or the psychiatry model, usually within the insurance, it's not the psychiatrist. It's just, it's just that they reframed it like it was primary care. And in primary care model, they, it's like what we call a med check, which is generally 10 to 15 minutes long. And I can ask you, obviously, having been in this field for a long time, how long does it typically take a patient to really start to express some of the more sensitive emotions? in a session it takes a while <laughs> yeah so while. they're not they're missing all of that so they have to do these sort of uh these efficiency which also loses a lot of accuracy cuts that's the that's the basic trade-off right there when you go with too efficient you lose it and that's why oftentimes we hear and probably you hear as well i'm not being listened to you know, I'm not being heard. And that's one of the most powerful healing mechanisms that we have, because I think a lot of the reasons why we're having these clients the way they are, one of the main ones is because of this disconnection and the, and the not feeling heard or listened to. I believe it was like there's a stat and, you know, I forget what year it was, but it's more recent that about 33 percent of the population doesn't have one person they can have a meaningful relation, a meaningful conversation with. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, you know, so no wonder it's important. And then you have a doctor because they're under the pressure. I'm not blaming them. It's the system uh, under the pressure. They have to they have to see four patients in order to make their practice work with all that. Of course, they can't listen to all the, the depth and despair. They would be so overwhelmed. They would actually burn out within about three weeks. So they can't do that. So then, of course, they have to kind of treat them like mechanisms, like a bag of symptoms. That's right, you ding off the you know, major depressive or general anxiety. Here you go. Here's your medication, and then let's come back in in about a couple of weeks. And unfortunately, it leads to more problems than it solves. Right, right. I I totally agree, and and that's what I found so helpful for uh, in your approach is that, you know, let's address making the person's life healthy, mm -hmm. you know, and and straighten out the medication even because, 
you know, I know I've worked with you with a few people who have kind of medication piled on top of medication and yeah. you're starting to unpack that. And where's the real person here without all that brain altering going on Absolutely. Um, so that we can then start to see what needs to get healthy. Plus, you know, these are people who don't necessarily have very healthy lifestyles. And so all that's affecting things. Too. Yeah. And I, and actually I appreciate, you know, having worked with you too is, and I think it's helpful for therapists to understand that themselves as well, that you may be, you know, when you're, there's a certain level of medication and obviously your experience and your, and your knowledge in this area helps you to understand, like, I could be the best therapist in the world, say the greatest things, you know, that, that would actually help, you know, them. But if they're too snowed, if they're too sedated, it, you then you need to find someone uh, who's willing to kind of work with you and, and allow you to kind of start to bring the medication so, so that you, they're reachable at that point, that they can actually remember. Because I often notice like with a lot of therapists, when they don't recognize that they may be, say, on, say, a large amount of like benzodiazepines or some other drug that might be blocking like a, like, like a, a the antipsychotic medication, which is being prescribed more and more now for non-psychosis conditions, just for sleep now, they're kind of doing that, which I'm very concerned about, uh, and all other types of conditions and just spread that you will, um, it does, like I said, you, to notice that, and like you've obviously noticed that yourself, that you can, you're kind of hitting yourself against the wall, because even if they get an insight, because it'll actually blocks a lot of times, it has an amnestic effect on the brain, then they come in the next session, like, wait a second, I, I, we just talked about this last session and, you know, you get that enough from, from just defense mechanisms as well, but then compound that with, uh, with a bunch of, uh, of medicines and then it, you're, you're up against a, a, an immovable uh, wall at that point. Right, right. And, and, you know, I think both people get burned out and frustrated in that kind of situation and, and the person doesn't get the help that they're looking for, which is what, and you don't get to provide that help either. Correct. And I also think, and I like in our interaction is that, you know, your desire and, you know, my desire to talk. Mm -hmm. How many, like how many psychiatrists have you actually had an opportunity to actually have conversations with, you know, and that's another problem when they're seeing, you know, you know whatever it's 16 clients in a day, you can imagine at the end of the day, they're not going to be wanting to want to talk more psychiatrists. They're going to be burnt out. And so uh -huh. that's one, again, it's the system. Again, I don't, I, I don't blame my colleagues for that because it's one of the reasons why I couldn't work in it that long because I could see ultimately, I was like, I, I'd burn out in two months in the system like this. It's just not designed to actually listen and to really hear a person on a deeper level because psychiatry is not family medicine. It's very different and it, and it should not be uh, kind of aligned in the same way. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. Um, it's interesting. I have colleagues who work at the Mayo Clinic uh, in Minnesota, but one of the things they were saying that they like is that, you know, they don't get paid based on how many clients they see or patients. Mm -hmm. It's really more on, you know, doing the work. They can do whatever they think is appropriate for that person. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a much different model that's much more helpful because mm -hmm. you spend more time and you connect with all the people involved in all the parts of that person's care. You know, mm -hmm. if they have medical issues, you know, or whatever, there's, you know, much more collaborative method. And that's a very different thing than, you know, I see you for 15 minutes and I have to sum everything up. Exactly. And I mean, and you, what you're highlighting, which is something I don't understand because we know, I mean, us, especially those of us who, who know the mining group, that team-based approach would be the very most, be one of the best ways. And some some of the like my wife uh, went to New Zealand recently to kind of explore and and do some work over there and they definitely emphasize this team based approach where you know you have the psychiatrist and they meet every morning for all the different people that they have and the different therapists like they'll have like a DBT therapist or a psychodynamic therapist or whatever and the social worker they often bring in the family and act, it was actually after that um, her interaction and and it just brought to me like. Yeah, of course. Why, why wouldn't we talk to the family? Why do we always just treat the individual when that individual, especially if they're in, the, it, it's one thing if they're living separately from the family, but if they're in the family, if you think you're going to make some changes and then they're going to wind up sustaining it because they see you for an hour a week, but the rest of the entire week they're spending with the family where those patterns, that maladaptive patterns took place, it's going to be very extraordinarily difficult. So again, I've, I've, I've then re-emphasized anytime I'm like a client, I, I would like to, if they're, especially if they're living together, let me, let me bring in a couple, let's see who these dynamics unfold. And then often, and then collaborating with people such as yourself, who 
uh, work, you know, in many of these different spaces as well. And having a bunch of different eyes, because we all, we're, none of us are perfect. We, especially when you're dealing with these heavy emotional areas. So having an extra pair of eyes, being open, being able to share and, and kind of uh, learn from each other and collaborate, I think is uh, something that's missing. And, you know, it's only when in situations such as when you and I work together or some other people where we see the value in that, but there's nothing incentivizing that. And I think that in, in a system-wide basis, we need to start incentivizing things like that because in the end, it will lead to a lot more benefit and it will be, it will, it will reduce a lot of other costs. So, anyway. Right. I totally agree. Um, what are some things that you would recommend for people now, given the situation that we're living under, that, you know, to stay healthy, um, you know, both psychologically and physically, what are the things they need to be doing to take care of kind of those different areas? Sure. Uh, and I, I go back to the basics. It's really that that's what it is. And, and, and one is to start to create a little bit of a schedule for yourself. Now, different people vary in that. And like some people can get too rigid and make too much of a schedule. But I think of a, a, a morning routine and an evening routine. I would, uh, if you're a news watcher, I would uh, limit no news after about two hours prior to sleep, creating a time that you go to sleep, uh, you know, and giving yourself eight hours of sleep opportunity. So for instance, if you choose to go to bed at 11, then you at least give yourself between 11 and seven to give your, your, your body an opportunity to sleep. You may not sleep the whole time, but these are the recommendations. I do highly recommend a book called Why Do We Sleep by Matthew Walker. I don't know if you've heard it's a New York Times bestseller. It's on Audible if you just don't feel like reading it, but it's a very good fundamental um, neuroscientific research uh, on on the latest. Uh, uh, it's mainly a, it's not a it's not like a strategy of how to better sleep, but gives you the the whole understanding. And I think he does a really good job to reach uh, the lay person without getting too technical on it, but giving a complete understanding. Because I think in our culture, we don't recognize the power of sleep. I've been, uh, after about 10 years of doing this clinical work, I've shifted I'm almost at, like 95% of my clients that come in the door, the first thing I look at is sleep. And oftentimes they'll say, oh yeah, I'm sleeping fine. But then I start to ask the questions and you could tell they're not. Like they, it may take them an hour or two to fall asleep. They're waking up multiple times. They may be waking up and they're getting six and they think that's good. But the vast majority of people do not operate well at six hours of sleep. So going back, that was a little bit of a tangent. That, like, that, I, that I took you seriously about in two ways. One is I've heard you say the thing about limiting the news two hours mm -hmm. before you, after you wake up and two hours before you go to bed. And I've done that. It was mm -hmm. really helpful. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Also, that's the one positive switch for me in this whole situation of the, of the lockdown is I'm getting more sleep because mm -hmm. I wouldn't allow much time for it. I just put too many things into my day. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, it's not that I had trouble sleeping, but I just didn't give much time for it. And uh, that shifted. Yeah. And, and just out of curiosity, you don't mind me asking, getting sure. that extra sleep, what, what is it? Have you felt a, a difference? Yeah, I don't feel tired in the afternoon now, <laughs> now that I'm getting more sleep. And I, you know, I definitely feel better. It definitely has been improved mood and made me feel better. Yeah, it's fundamental. Like 90 to 95 percent of all mood disorders are pre, uh, you know, is a uh, is pre uh, predetermined before you're having a poor sleep beforehand. Uh, and so that's a that that number always struck me. And then I didn't understand why my colleagues didn't super focus on that. And oftentimes we're given just medicines that often make it worse. So Ambien, the Z drugs, uh, they they suppress REM sleep, and that's actually one of the, the areas now. You you can read this in the Why Do We Sleep book, but where we recalibrate our emotional circuitry. And people, when they if they just if you just um, it happens 60 to 90 percent of your um, of your REM sleep happens usually in the last third of sleep. So if you start to wake up that terminal insomnia, start waking up a little bit earlier, you, you're cutting out a majority of REM sleep, which um, we now know like uh, it allows you to, like I said, recalibrate your emotional circuitry. And when they actually in labs, when they cut people's REM sleep off, they would show them neutral faces and they would interpret it as being negative. So you can imagine now like whether you're on a, on a, a like you're, you're a first responder or you're, you know, just an, another American. And we're, we're being now inundated with tremendous amounts of video and tremendous amount of, of images. And a lot of that stuff can be gray, but, you know, if we started getting more irritable. We're not feeling quite as rested. We had, um, there's a tendency for more fear and rage to kick in when you're not getting enough sleep. And then you can imagine now all of a sudden neutral things start looking more negative and, and, and say a little bit negative things look a little bit more. And now we can start to understand how this polarization effect starts to affect people. But 
So anyway, sleep is fundamental and, and what time you wake up is fundamental as well. Uh, because if you start going in, what I noticed with a lot of my clients is that they would start to go to sleep later and later in the day, what we call phase shifting, advancing. And what that does, is, of course, then it makes you go to bed later and later and later afterwards. So that's generally a problem. So what, you know, stay within a one to, you know, one hour kind of difference so, so that if you go to bed, maybe on the weekends, you go, you stay about an hour bed later, but then uh, making sure you don't nap during that particular day so that you maintain your sleep schedule consistency because I'll just leave with this and I can move on to the next one and that is one thing that people don't recognize is that the consistency of sleep is extraordinarily important. What a lot of people, one of the biggest things I see in my clinic is people go to bed at 10, then they go to bed at 12, and they go to bed at 9, and then they go to bed at 11 and I tell them, and I said, well listen, the, the neuroscience is fairly clear. Once you start to move your, your sleep by more than an hour, in a particular day, you're creating what I would call perpetual jet lag. And what do you feel like when you have jet lag? You know, you're, you're a little bit more irritable, things, your concentration goes down a little bit, you're tired. And you can imagine if you're doing that for years, which often people are, uh, we just sort of get used to this kind of weight. And then as we get older, we're wondering why we like, oh yeah, my weight's staying the same, but it feels like gravity all, all of a sudden just turned on and it's not about two to three times. I was just feeling like just everything is just, lugging my life around so that became a major focus in my practice and i often use different behavioral and supplemental techniques first if you know if we have to something in extreme cases we'll have to use medicines but then try to get them away as quickly as possible and then the other thing is getting body movement of some sort and oftentimes you know a lot of people i call it body movement rather than using the exercise word because people tend to uh uh, you know, recoil sometimes from that. And what I found to be the best uh, way to get people who don't normally exercise, I said, do you, do you like any songs, you know, to move to? Can you, can we just start with maybe one song a day where you just move your body to it? I don't care if you have, you feel like you don't have rhythm or not, but just rock your body, move it to it. Eventually you'll get more comfortable. If you want to close down the shades or whatever it is that you want to do, just give yourself maybe dance to one song in the morning and maybe one at night. And uh, and 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 interestingly, of all, I've tried many in my lifestyle. I used to be a, 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 a physical trainer back in the day before I went to medical school. Uh, I found out that this, this one was one of the, the more effective ones that people could listen to. So again, going to sleep, then there's like, you know, just uh, your, um, you know, body movement, just getting a little bit, especially rhythmic body movement really helps soothe the nervous system and and you know whether that and even going for like a walk or something along those lines and doing it when you can outside and getting about 15 minutes of sunshine every day it's incredibly important it's one of the most powerful neurological total body nu nutrients we spend so much money myself included on supplements and i'm going to tell you one thing it's the number one supplement that's for free you know, we often get um, I, you know, afraid about the sun, but 10 to 15 minutes of sunshine actually improves skin collagen production. It improves your ability because you, as long as you're not wearing sunglasses during that time, you'll get a little bit of melanin, which will actually protect your, uh, your skin. And then you can go in and then afterwards put on your sunblock and you'll actually improve the, the, the your, your skin will be a little bit more uh, plump and, and it'll actually look you know, healthier. And you'll get a little vitamin D, you'll, you'll stimulate something called brain derived neurotropic factor, which is a, like brain fertilizer, improving brain growth, uh, neuroplasticity, and you improve mood because what it does is any lingering melatonin in your brain at that point, it's the light that comes in there that breaks the mel melatonin into serotonin, which then improves mood and well-being overall. So you combine that with a little bit of exercise, and then that will actually, if you do that within the first three hours of waking up, you set up a very powerful circadian rhythm. If you do that about a week, it'll make it a lot easier to fall asleep. So I would say, you know, the exercise that, and those are some of the fundamental starting kits. And then if I want to add just one more, if you don't mind, because I've sure. seen the rise in there, and that's the rise in alcohol use. It's been uh, good. I'm sorry. I've seen that as well. And I guess the World Health Organization has said that worldwide with this pandemic, alcohol use has gone up. Correct. And and um, and so like, you know, liquor stores, I think it was like 30 percent or something along those lines, increased sales. Uh, and, and it's understandable. And I'm seeing it in a lot of my patients as well. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest problem comes back to it's the most potent suppressor of REM sleep. So when you, you REM sleep, like we just talked about before, it's emotional uh, regulating capacity. It also is involved in decision-making. 
So obviously we're all making some pretty interesting, powerful situations with everything shifting the way it is. You want your decision-making capacity to be as sharp as possible. It's gonna really bring that down significantly and your creativity. And, and, and you know, even if you're not an artist, there's gonna be a calling right now with all these shifting parameters to come up with different novel creative solutions, both you know, for those of us who are involved on a higher level or strategy, but also your home level, your family strategy level. So you want that all on board. And when you drink, it suppresses it, even if you're drinking it relatively early. So what I can just say to people is if you know, have to ask yourself, what is making you drink? And is there other alternatives that can give you whatever benefits you're feeling from the alcohol? Uh, and, and you know that we can do that too. And, and also if you feel like there's an avoidance pattern, it's not gonna go away. Like avoiding something's not gonna go away. So try to find someone that you trust and try to reach out to people, professionals such as yourself or anyone else uh, for that matter, that would be helpful to give you the, 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 the helpful guidance to get you out. So because it's only gonna make it the whole deeper if the longer you let it fester. Um, and so the more we can bring people out of that, it's not a moral issue. And I wanna make sure people recognize this is not moral. And anybody, including any professional that has judgment towards you, fire them move on because they actually haven't done their work and they're actually causing more harm than good and i want to make sure people who've ever had that judgment laid upon them that it's not their fault and that's actually uh, an issue that the other person needs to kind of check their own way of, of addressing people i totally agree and and also you talk to people about eating more balanced and healthy especially i mean i know somebody i work with that came to see you was only eating late at night and not eating the rest of the day that's not a good pattern for you know, health for your body or mind. Yeah, it's very, especially if you're stressed. You know, it's what, what was once called a warrior diet where you would eat once a day and some people do that. But what happens is in, in practicality in our society, it's not designed for our current society. I think you have to eat at least two meals a day. Mm -hmm. There are people who do some intermittent fasting, which does have some benefits. I do recommend though, if you're incredibly stressed, that intermittent fasting as healthy as it can be is not the time to do it. You wanna first wait to your stress system balances itself out a little bit more because it is a little bit of stress to go into the catabolic mode of the fast part of that where people are fasting for 14 to 16 hours but there is a lot of benefit to it but don't do it when you're feeling really um, like your moods are really dysregulated you want to balance out your blood sugar at that point uh, and by eating a lot of foods that are uh, not devoid of um, their fiber and oftentimes most a lot of the foods that people are eating they've uh, they've artificially ripped away the fibers from the foods and that helps act like a time release mechanism to allow people to stay um, satiated and allows them to kind of absorb a lot of other powerful nutrients in there and and really creates more balance in the microbiome in our stomach which we're now knowing a little bit more that it's it profoundly affects mood especially anxiety in my case i've noticed a lot where a lot of people, you know, there's a, there's a, I think there's a real reason why a lot of people who experience anxiety feel it in their stomach, in their GI tract. And I think there is a correlation that there is an in, maybe mild inflammation or something going on in there that does need a little bit of addressing uh, that is often helped by just some, you have to do some radical changes, but just by dropping away certain pro-inflammatory foods, fried foods being one of the biggest ones that I feel like it's what, what I call oxidized fats. Uh, trying to eat more raw nuts and seeds. Uh, my favorites would be the omega-3 seeds like walnuts, uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, especially if you're a woman. Uh, flax seeds are incredibly helpful. Just one to two tablespoons done most days of the week would lower breast cancer rates by up to 40 to 40, 46 to 47 percent. And it actually carries a nice phytoestrogen load. So those who are nearing uh, in the perimenopausal period, they can help kind of add uh, some extra natural estrogens in the body to kind of help alleviate some of the symptoms that may come along. Uh, there's other things you could do along with that as well. But sticking to the healthy fats, avocados are a nice fat for the body to help act like kind of a lubricant for your uh, blood vessels. Those are mainly omega-9. Uh, and it has low, it's the highest fruit of vitamin Bs and, uh, and kind of following those kind of things. And then the berries are another big one for the brain. So blueberries, uh, raspberries, cherries, any strawberry like that, they have these, uh, in, you know, impressive compounds called anthocyanins and polyphenols, which again, promote neuroplasticity. And, and just to kind of highlight, one of the main things I've come to learn is that if you look at most of the dysfunctions that are going on in the brain, there's two kind of major parts. One is the neuroplasticity part 
how well your brain can grow and adapt to its current level of changes. And then the inflammation part where inflammation, which is kind of like, which can act like, a, uh, like it actually makes the brain more likely to atrophy. It can create brain cells, say in the hippocampus, it can actually make them die. Good thing that is the hippocampus can grow them back typically. So that's a good thing. But so those are the kind of major um, overhauls. There's other things like green leafy vegetables and stuff like that. We can, I can talk to your talk to you for about an hour and a half on that, but I don't think we want to do that. But I'll touch base. We hit some of the major areas, and then I work with each client to get an understanding. But the one other thing is refine, reducing refined sugar. Refined sugar and processed carbohydrates uh, are pro-inflammatory to the nervous system in many different ways and uh, often cause a lot more damage. And even though I understand up front, it gives a soothing. There's a, there's a self-soothing thing on that one. So, you, so as a therapist or psychiatrist, you have to address that first before you start yanking that away because they'll just keep going back on. You have to kind of address it at the emotional level first. Right, right. Yeah, the green leafy vegetables is good. And my one of the things my husband is doing to adapt to this pandemic is he's growing organic vegetables. So mm. we have lots of green leafy vegetables coming in. Nice. Excellent. So the, the very locally grown um, <laughs> green leafy vegetables right now. Um, if you ever want to share, please let me know. <laughs> oh, definitely. Believe me, we get a little overwhelmed sometimes. Um, <laughs> I will pass that a lot. Uh, you know, with one thing I find people feeling really stressed about is because we're getting such mixed messages about things opening up and, you know, more people are out and about. Mm -hmm. uh, if you drive around, I notice. Uh, and, you know, yet we're also hearing it's not really safe yet or, you know, numbers are going up in different areas. And, you know, um, I just feel like a lot of people feel out of step if they're still sheltering in place because they feel like, but wait, other people aren't. And it, it's just a confusing time mm -hmm. for people, you know, um, how to make decisions around that. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, because, you know, first you have the CDC saying not to wear a mask. And then you say now to wear a mask. Now there's walking again on not, you know, whether to wear masks or not. So what do you do in this situation? And, and so it's, it's a difficult question. And it's understandable because we're social species. So if we model other ones and all of a sudden, you, like you said, you start to feel a little bit out of step. Maybe you start to kind of sidestep your own sort of intuition. But I think it's uh, when, it, when I was talking to someone else regarding this, it's like your own level of uh, kind of risk evaluation as well. Because even going outside is a risk. Going in your car is a risk. So we have to kind of look and evaluate what those risks are. Uh, if you're coming into contact with people who are in the higher level, like who have either comorbidities or over the age of 60 or 65, where they might uh, have a higher, much higher chance of having a more severe case, then you have to kind of take those factors into consideration as to the level of sort of risk um, tolerance that you will take on and and kind of because you, you also are, have a, a certain level of responsibility. So, you know, in, in my, you know, I was pretty much, uh, I've been keeping up on a lot of the literature on this and there's uh, some many interesting theories regarding uh, the, the virus itself. I'm not, I don't know if I want to get too far into that as well, but one of the theories that, you know, that was coming out would then show, would, would highlight that it probably was going to be very weak and susceptible to UV light. So I've always been a big fan, and that's why I, I highlighted here about going out in the sun, getting your sunshine, going outside. Uh, a lot of people that were catching it in the second half in over in New York, they were when they were doing the contact trace, they were they were they're mainly social distancing at and at home. You know, they caught a lot of the the illnesses at that point. So again, I think the thing is too is you want to strengthen up your immune system. A lot of times we're not getting talked about, except for maybe some people who are kind of promoting like you know some intensive, not well studied studies like IV drug, you know, kind of you know vitamins and stuff like that. But fundamentally, like keeping your body strong, going outside, doing those kind of things would be extraordinarily helpful to kind of uh, be able to work through that here. And then, you know, there's just a lot of other things that. Uh, uh, it's like a like what I, I can say what I do, and I don't know if that's really, but I I, I want to be able to see people's faces from afar. So when I'm outside, I carry my mask with me, 
and I'm there. So when we're about to get closer to somebody, because mainly the mask is that designed to, so that you're not going to spread to someone else, I'll put the mask on. If I see someone who doesn't have a mask on, obviously, because I'm also going to be seeing clients, so I'm also going to be with a population that might be a little more susceptible, then I just, I politely, I don't get upset. I just kind of politely walk across and you know people have different ways of looking at the world and i'm not going to sit here and get upset with anyone who doesn't agree exactly what way i see it uh where obviously it gets a little trickier is like if you're in a store and then someone and you're in line and then you're kind of squelched, squelched you know, kind of being squelched in between and then another person's coming in and they're not maybe wearing a mask if they saw it took theirs off or they're kind of not doing the social distancing so I go with uh, like the what, what's called the, the late night FM DJ voice. This comes from a book from Chris Voss called Never Split the Difference. Uh, it's about negotiation. So just it's really your tone. And a lot of people say, well, I just told them the distance. But if you're already getting annoyed, because oftentimes it takes a little time to speak up and people don't recognize that, like, social distancing, please. You know, and they say, well, that would be actually a nice thing to say. But if you're saying it in that sort of tone, so it just be okay. It, just a little more space, please. You know, it's the tone that really makes a big difference. And and you just quick in there. And if again, if they're in their own little space and they're arranging along, then go ahead and, and find a manager because the corporations at that point, they will handle the thing. Don't get yourself involved in all that. But keeping the major, you know, the, the social distancing when possible. But I've gone out, we've, we've met with like friends outdoors. We've always stayed six feet apart. And then, you know, and then we're, we're allowed to have these like conversations. We actually do usually around eight feet apart. As long as we're not showing signs and symptoms in that way, you know, there's ways I do feel like the social nutrition is a, an important thing to have. Uh, moving around and, and doing those kind of things. Of course, whenever I go indoors, because that's where it seems to be much more contagious, I wear a mask, you know, mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's it. You know, you do that. And then when you come home, you know, just basic stuff, wash your hands for 20 seconds. Um, if I've been around a lot of outdoor stuff, although there doesn't seem as much evidence now about contact spreading, which is I'm so happy about. And, but I still, I like to change. My, to come outside, it's like, I still like to change my clothes take a nice shower, it feels good anyway. So I'm okay with that for now until we get a little bit more information. Because the other thing we don't know is that this could always mutate. We don't know. If they are, viruses tend to mutate and they may acquire new, but maybe they become less resilient, you know, less uh, vulnerable to UV light. Could happen. We don't know. That's what viruses do. So you want to keep, and you want to be flexible and be able to change and adjust with the tides. But again, making your own personal risk assessment. Right, right. And, you know, in my personal situation, I do have elderly and uh, family members with pre-existing conditions. So we're being extremely careful and not mm -hmm. really interacting. But we're lucky because we have a big extended family. So we're all together doing mm -hmm. this. So we have the social element, you mm -hmm. know, our kids to play with. And, you know, that's very nice, you know, sure. <laughs> have people to hang out with. Um, but we, you know, but we're keeping those people safe and, and isolated, uh, even from us, you know, Absolutely. and we're, we're keeping things very careful so that we stay well, we could take care of them, you mm -hmm. know, that kind of thing. But it's but it's complicated. And I think everybody's got to make their own risk assessment and adjust to what their situation really is. Mm -hmm. You know Exactly. Yeah. You know, like okay. I had like uh, the trickier situations that are coming up, like I have a, a niece and my uh, she she's uh, being uh, cared for by my uh, my parents who are in, the, you know, my dad's close to 80. My mom's close to 70 and and she travels back and forth. And, you know, if they open up schools up in the, in that area and then she's traveling and then coming back, like I don't know how many nasal pharyngeal swabs she's going to be able to tolerate, you know, in each one. So it, it does lend itself to some tricky situations. And. These are the things we need to be discussing. And I think, unfortunately, there's no centralized way to really kind of negotiate like what it is, like how we're going to do this, you know, how, what are the kind of general guidelines. But then I think we need to also then re-emphasize uh, local, local action, really developing the strength in the local communities. I think one thing that this has proven because I, I can't, I'm honestly, I have less faith in federal government in general. So it's and more faith in local community localized government and strengthening that and participating that as much as possible. Because I think that's where we're at, because every pocket is going to be a little bit different. We've been kind of pretty blessed here in Santa Barbara. Uh, we haven't had many cases. We've been able to reopen a lot of things uh, fairly, you know, much more robustly than in other areas of the country. And I think, you know, that's you, you base it on data. You know, you have to really try to base this on, on data. And even that we can have another 
conversation with, but that could be tricky as well, depending upon the, the legitimacy of the data. But we do our best what we, what we have and doing it that way. We're not going to be perfect. We don't have to sit here and blame each other, but this is what we call the dance. And the dance has forward movements and it has backward movements. And we have to be comfortable with that's what dancing entails. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing I found is that telehealth we're kind of thrust into um, a bit overnight. Uh, for some of us, we're doing some of it already. I know you were, I was, I was doing a bit. But, um, you know, a lot of that can be very effective and, mm -hmm. it keep, and it does keep everybody safe. You know, it's, again, not quite the same as seeing the whole person walking around and in your office, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, I found it to be pretty effective. I don't know your thoughts about that, but um, I found it to be pretty helpful. Yeah, I, I have to say it took me about a year, though, personally, I'm just being really honest, till I felt like I could deliver the same level of connection. I do think it, there is a learning curve uh, to be able to pick up the subtleties of the paraverbal and nonverbal language that's there. Also, just simple things of like telling your clients to have their hands free. You may not think that off front, but they, they may be holding something at the end. Of course, without gesturing, you're limiting their emotional expression and you will get a lot less from the person. So um, I, I did send out one time, like kind of like my 10 points because it took me a while to figure out what were the things that would make it easier, uh, make the transition, not only for the client, but for the therapist or, or a medical professional as well. Because one of the things is eye care because you're constantly then staring at a screen for a while and you'll notice you'll get burnt out pretty quickly. You'll feel a little bit more tired. So you, I, I, I put a point where it's like just past where it doesn't look like I'm looking completely away from the client. It's like they can still see my eyes, but it's about 20 feet away. So I can every, every now and then just once in a session be able to kind of do that to just relax my eyes so that I can refocus. Because if you're doing like six hours of these, repeatedly over and over again, you'll notice that's when it happened. Actually, it started hurting my eyes after about a month or two. Um, and so that's one of the things that use a lot of eye drops using these are blue light, uh, have a, like about 30% blue light blocking so that reduce and glare. These are important things, I think, as a practitioner to uh, emphasize so that, it, you know, 68% of the, when your eyes are open, 68% um, of the energy uh, that goes to visual processing into your brain. It's, it's, it's the most dominant thing that goes on when your eyes are open. So it's a very powerful thing and you want to take care of that area for yourself. Um, I just wanted to highlight that on the practitioner side. I think those are helpful things. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, yeah, and it does take some getting used to. It is an adjustment yes. period. Um, and I, I think that the hard part for a lot of people is they were thrust into it without getting to sort of get their feet wet first, you exactly. know, and, and I really think it makes it hard. Um, uh, I also think we're seeing, you know, one thing that there's been uh, some recent studies showing anxiety is up, depression is up. I think something like say a third of American adults right now are experiencing one of those two things. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think they're giving a clinical diagnosis. I think they're talking about symptoms. But um, but I think people are really um, struggling right now even more than than prior to this whole situation. And you know I think partly the uncertainty issue, which I don't think mm -hmm. people love uncertainty. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think we like predictability, you know, to some extent, we like novelty. Some nice surprises, sure, and that's yeah. about the limit of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so I just see more people struggling right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's going to be, you know, a lot of after effects, I think, of this whole experience in terms of those things. And, you know, research on prior pandemics, you know, suicide rates have gone up, and I know already suicide hotline calls have gone up dramatically and text mm -hmm. lines calls around anxiety, uh, you know, or texts around anxiety, all that sort of thing. So uh, I think there's going to be a lot of mental health consequences of all this. Yeah, it's like, uh, I kind of was talking about this, it's like the person who is really good when they're, um, quote unquote, really good when, when someone dies and they're taking care of everything, they take care of all the funeral arrangements, they're doing all that stuff, and like, wow, they're taking it so well, and they don't see them six months later. When it just everything just kind of like because they put everything what I call on the emotional credit card and it's gaining interest. They just compartmentalize and then and that has a huge cost, especially the longer that compartmentalizing goes. And I think you're right. I think what we're going to be seeing here is that the, there might have been the uh, the wave of COVID coming through, but now I think we're going to see the wave of the neck uh, of the mental health issues, especially with all the distrust that's going on with um, with media, with our governmental institutions. You know, there used to be a thing where 
there is a pride, uh, you know, in, in in certain aspects of our nationalism, but that's being called into question, uh, and and all this other stuff going on. So there's people do, you know, uh, it, for in large part do need a kind of connection to something larger than themselves, and that larger than themselves is crumbling before their eyes. And and also we're there's with the still a lot of the shelter in place. One of the biggest things we're really missing and we're not really talking about is touch. And that's a typical thing because that's a nutritional need for the body. And like, how do you solve that issue? You know, oftentimes I talk about gesturing and and you know synchronous kind of things where teammates, you know, who might like pound their chest at certain times, but but by in sync movements in their body, it creates a sense of connection. So whether people could come up with dances and dance with each other, but not touching each other, but doing that could get you a felt sense of in syncness. That's what like tribes would do when they would chant or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So those things are maybe some of the unique ways we'll have to sort of adapt to this particular situation so that we can nourish uh, these, these actually very deep primal needs. Otherwise, yeah, we're gonna continue to see anxiety, depression, trauma or re-traumatization happening and, and addictions uh, skyrocket, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. I agree. Um, oh, one other one interesting thing, you know, you're talking about people who think we should be using masks and people who think we shouldn't and all the, you know, confusing information we've gotten. But also mm -hmm. one thing I noticed, a lot of people feel kind of freaked out by masks, mm -hmm. um, even by wearing them. They can feel yeah. very suffocating. Um, That's right. But Especially also, panic disorder people. Yeah. And then, and then the other thing is, you know, people with nothing a little scary, you know? So, I mean, it, that's going to be a big adjustment, it seems like to me, because partly how we read people is seeing their whole face and seeing their facial expressions. Exactly. So, you know, masks on, mm -hmm. you know, and it's one of the things that makes me think about going back to in-person therapy. If you're going to sit in the same room with somebody, are you both going to be wearing masks? That's not going to be a good for psychotherapy in my mind, no. anyhow. Yeah, I can tell you what we've done, because in some cases I do have to see people in, in person and oftentimes people who have a high level, you know, a tendency towards paranoia and a camera is certainly not going to work with a lot of people in that situation. Uh, and so I've had to do that. So I go greater than six feet distance and, you know, we wear the mask, we create the distance. I put a, I, like I have it well ventilated. I have a HEPA filter with a, you know, a UVC light, light that's right next to me blasting on high, uh, keeping the air circulation when they leave, everything is opened up, doors are opened up, just because it's really the ventilation, getting the light in, getting plenty of light in, in that kind of situation. That's how I handle it. Now, it, does that increase my risk? Probably to some extent, but you know, it's also you have to again, you have to make this assessment for yourself and allow that person instead of falling into the hospital, getting you know, escalating, but we'll allow to have that kind of connection. So, on that level, you know, every it's not a you know, if anyone says they know the answer to something like that, then they're speaking usually from an emotional place and not a logical place. And you can kind of like, and I don't mean the batter, emo, I'm just saying where it's more intense and not really you know, considering things on the complexity that it is and that in each case we have to be willing to kind of look at it from case by case basis and if you're not sure like we're doing like right now or doing, is talk to a colleague this is a time when we need to talk to people that we trust and be able to because if we're you want to get into your own kind of polarized echo chamber where you're just kind of going off we that's how we balance each other out is through our social connection and communicating and i would actually do it on something like a medium like this on zoom where you can make eye contact where you can read lips where you can hear tonality you can see i'm i am i'm a i'm a new jersey boy i gesture a lot so <laughs> I mean, but you can read I within that <laughs> yeah. so but you can read a lot more into what i'm saying based on that information as opposed to if i was just sort of texting you or we're just talking on a monotone type of phone situation absolutely absolutely um one um yeah i was going to ask you specifically about people with OCD, because like, as you said, it really is um, sort of escalated in this time, you know? I mean, I especially saw that at the beginning. It's like, you know, when, when we were thinking it was everywhere on surfaces, you know, not touching anything or wiping uh -huh. everything down a million times a day, uh -huh. you know, how smelling like bleach, um, <laughs> you, know, um, you know, these toxic chemicals, but you know, that also do kill the virus or whatever. But um, I think that there's, you know, um, I, I see a lot of people with, OCD especially struggling to, during this time, and I just wondered if you had specific suggestions around that. Yeah, you know, uh, 
a couple things is uh, get your information because a lot of times OCD people will get too caught up in, in researching and looking at people. I would say of all the people who's been presenting information on COVID, you know, because I'm sure they're doing a lot of research, is Scott Gottlieb. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Scott Gottlieb, but I think he's a former director of the FDA, uh, epidemiologist. You know, a lot of people have been kind of, uh, I think he's been the most free of both, not going being in, in, in the left or right camp, but really just looking at factual information and reporting upon it and coming up with what he would say is our, 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 our expert expert like uh, policy decision. So finding people that are not trying to scare you, like if you feel like you're hearing someone, and you hear all these dramatic language and people like it's a, you know, a tidal wave or a tsunami switch move to someone who's not using that type of language because they're really trying to actually hijack your attention and that's one of the problems that's gone on i think what happens is the, with the internet and twitterverse kind of uh, impacting a lot of people people have gone into what we call you know click baiting but with click baiting with their words and and just sort of hijacking you and then you're afterwards you're just going to be frazzled so you want to look at people who are really citing um, information in a way that of course that's understandable and that makes sense to you and working with that because i want to first start with the filtering of information and really managing your informational ecology because if you're already being dinged and you can tell that you're getting a little bit kind of more into your um, whatever it might be, whether it's cemeteries, uh, you know, whether it's contamination, fears, whatever it might be, that's uh, that's just an indicator. And also seeking out extra help at the, during this time, I think that's critical. Uh, if, you know, if you're at once every two weeks and you have a good connection to your therapist, then go to maybe once every week or go, you know, maybe twice a week for a while, get, get yourself back on balance and then you could always wean yourself off afterwards, but really don't hesitate because you will, you will lose a lot more if you do. And so I want to just kind of highlight that part. Now, on the sense of the, the thinking part uh, where you're, you're dealing with that, you know, I often work with the body uh, and I train people with uh, like what I call the, the sixth sense awareness as sensing into the body. And uh, I often will have people describe to me when they have OCD is like, what is it? What is your when you feel compelled to do something? What's it like inside your body? Like, really, let's go into the compulsion signature you know in the body and really starting to get a sense of that and so i'll have the you know kind of bring the person's attention there uh if they happen to have a very rapid attention i'll have them do some physical exercise first that actually seems to be a good way i work with a lot of people with very fast minds who have difficulty at attending like this but once they get to that point they can sense and like what's it like to feel compelled to do something but describe it to me in actual purely descriptive terms like like is it is it an expanding feeling does it feel like a wobbling inside a kind of a, a, a like a, an electri electrified feeling in the body where do you feel it is it in the chest or in the belly so as they're doing this it, it, it has it serves a variety of functions but one is it actually is acting like an exposure therapy to it uh, it's like you, you're not even doing a response prevention you're just actually going to the the sensations itself and then you recognize as they explore it and they're just being with it they're not trying to get rid of it they're not trying to do any of that stuff Again, these are all the things as a therapist would do, would point out and allow themselves to get more in line with their body. And what it's doing, because I think one of the things at heart of OCD is a fracturedness between the head and the body. And I think the reintegration of the head with the body is one of the things that I found in my line of work to be the most profound helpers in reintegrating. Because once they get back in tune with the body and they're sensing it, and I like to do them a little, like even a couple minutes every day on their own, just exploring that, instead of just always looking when the body is feeling there's something uncomfortable, actually when it's actually feeling comfortable. Because that will start to reintegrate a new relationship with the body. Like you, people will try to do these like mantras, like I love myself, I love myself, but we know that doesn't really work very often. Maybe you get one very hypnotically inclined client that can do that to themselves, but for the most part, that's that you, you're that that inner kind like that's a bunch of BS, <laughs> and, yeah. and it ain't gonna sink in. But just giving it attention is the most powerful tool that you have psychologically whatever you give attention to gives it power so giving attention to your body gives it power and it's also it's like sunshine it's like it gives it an ability for things to sort of heal and a lot and that healing and that trust will start to generally bring down a lot of that kind of driving that obsessive, you know, that the obsessive compulsive mind might do and just finally just as a one last tip when people get into that rumination pattern of thinking about the past or a worry pattern i always tell them to go it's kind of sounds weird at first i go, I go feel into your thought 
And so rather, because that's a closed system. So what we know in neuroscience is that the emotions drive the range of thoughts you have access to. And it, it's a closed system. So it's like if I made you really angry right now, Lisa, there's not going to be, you're not going to be accessing a lot of joyful, fun vacation <laughs> memories at that particular time. You're going to be taking any other time that, that person act like an ass to you. And then you're going to be like, and it's just going to come in like that. Same thing when you're feeling fearful, when an OCD kind of situation, you're just going to be, you only have access mainly to fearful thoughts. So rather than playing with, like I said, the, 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 the wave coming on, I always talk about duck underneath the wave. Go to the source of what's driving those thoughts in the first place. Come back down into the sensations there, because that's what drives it. Because if you didn't have those sensations, if you had those thoughts and your body was completely relaxed, it wouldn't drive you. So let's go to the source. And that's where I start to help people. And then that helps them when they go to see people like you, they get more, they train their attention. And then it's faster for you to have those kind of emotional corrective experiences and insights. Right, right. I think that's so important. Um, I like that going under the wave. <laughs> I, will, I will borrow that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, what do you think would be the most important things for people to learn? You know, I, I like, you know, from this conversation, I was thinking about, you know, what you said near the beginning about this model that looks at the, you know, psychobiological, social, spiritual, kind of that whole, part, all those different parts of a person and how do you mm -hmm. nourish each of those parts during this time, you know, mm -hmm. nourish your connections by either seeing friends, you know, at a, at a safe distance or even just virtually, you know, but at least making contact, um, you know, really trying to find some meaning for yourself at this time. Mm -hmm. Even though you can't do the things that used to give you meaning quite so much, um, right. you know, what's meaning going to be now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, uh and, you know, just all those different aspects, you know, getting out, taking a walk. I know for me, that's been essential to surviving this period. Yes, absolutely. I, live, I live on a ranch, so we can go take a walk and just be on our own property and try to do that at the end of every day. Gorgeous. You know, just out in nature, uh, get in the sun, you know, like you said, uh, go down and visit my husband in his garden, um, whatever mm -hmm. it might be. But, you know, getting out, you know, sure. um, you know, and then, you know, trying to you know, eat healthy and take care of your body in those ways and sleep, you know, during this time. Um, and, you know, just that kind of whole picture of all the different pieces going on. Mm -hmm. So you mean a kind of a summary of how to go about that and how to, yeah. is that, I just wanted to make sure I'm clear. On, yeah, that'd be really helpful, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I find uh, for, it depends. Some people, because when you're changing lifestyle habits and it's hard enough to do that when things are going well for you it's it's doubly hard so one of the things is is uh i, I think it's better if I, I talk a little bit about just creating new habits a little bit and and how to do so in an effective way uh, i think i've given some tips in the past before what you can do and, and one of those things again i would highlight is start with sleep Start with giving your body the sleep because that will fundamentally give you more energy. Um, if you're not getting good sleep, your craving is going to go up, your impulsivity is going up, and your judgment is going to go down. It can be very hard to, to take on any new habits when that's not happening, when you're getting poor sleep. And then you're just going to want to berating yourself and, and then kind of increasing the power of your own inner critic, which is one of the biggest things that kind of uh, thwarts our ability to create meaningful change in our lives. So that's where I, I often kind of uh, draw the line at that particular point. Now, when you're taking on new habits, uh, one of the things I like to do is try to get a sense of what it is that you value first. Because if you're just taking it on just because either, you know, you said it or I said it or anyone that matter, it's oh, it sounds good. But how often do people really take that on? It has to come from a level of, of value and meaning. Like, what is it that you want your life to stand for? Uh, you know, this is a time where you actually can, you know, things are changing. And but there are certain elements in your life that have always brought meaning to your life. What, what are those? Even when you're not feeling it right now, maybe you're depressed or anxious. But before that happened. What was it that used to really drive you? And, and that those are the things you want to highlight, whether it's love, whether it's creativity, whether it's uh, taking, you know, you know, having a healthy body, whether it's having good energy, whether it's being authentic, whether it's, you know, whatever things that drive, uh, drive you, freedom, truth, those kind of things. And by getting a sense of that, then you're going to have to say, OK, well, you know, what will I uh, what, what will be 
the best way to go about uh, expressing those values of mind. And then once you make that connection, it adds the, the kind of a little bit more fuel to enable you to kind of be able to do some of the habits that are being, that will probably most likely be beneficial to you. But getting outside, I think right away, as quickly as you can to get outside, because there's this tendency to just sort of sit around, just kind of, you know, lay in bed, or if you have to just get right up and just, you're just, you get the, you're hitting the, the, the big alarm clock, it jacks up your cortisol system, you're already not feeling so great, you're then downing, you know, 16 ounces of coffee, and then you're just going ahead, and then you, and a lot of times people who are now working at home, they thought it was going to be a, a, a kind of a fun thing, but now their boundaries have been kind of eroded. They, a lot of my, um, my executives are saying, like, no one knows that I'm being talked to, so he, they're getting like three or phone calls coming in simultaneously without their normal uh, person who would normally field that off on them. And so they're working like usually straight through. So uh, so it, it, it's, it, there's a big difference between some people who are, who are needing more to do and others who have too much to do. It's been, again, it's this polarizing effect on multiple levels, which I think is one of the reasons why we're having so much chaos go on and spread throughout and on many levels of order throughout our entire society at this point. But uh, again, so um, one of the things that was helpful, uh, there's a book, Atomic Habits. I don't know if you heard, I think it's either James or Thomas Clear, so I apologize to the author if I uh, misspoke on that. But, uh, you know, one thing is you want to cue yourself uh, to be able to cue if you want to start a new behavior, have something external that allows you to remind yourself. So if you want to start walking, maybe you have your walking shoes right by the door. Uh, so that and you're going to walk right past it. So it just kind of lubricates yourself into that particular new uh, behavioral pattern that allows you to do that. And also, what is the walking for? Like, are you doing it just because someone told you it was good for you? But align it with something that is meaningful and value to yourself. That will make it more likely to be consistent and work for you. And, uh, and, and, you know, doing those kind of things. So some sort of morning ritual uh, that allows yourself. And, and, and listen, if you struggle with eating, uh, kind of like an unhealthy diet. Well, how about let's just start with your breakfast. Let's start with something very basic that's easy to do. Perhaps it's oatmeal with some berries and some nuts and seeds or whatever, something that you can make the night before if you're cramming and just put it in the refrigerator and you can take it out. No, most people don't realize like with rolled oats, you don't necessarily have to cook them. They can soak overnight and they'll be ready to go if you want to and then throw in some nuts and seeds on there. Start your day off right. Um, that way, maybe instead of going into eating, drinking five gallons of coffee, we maybe switch a little bit to some green tea instead that has some other you know, benefits. It's less likely to kind of jack up your nerve your nervous system and then leave you kind of fried afterwards. It has a much more kind of stable effect, uh, those kind of things. And so maybe start off with a healthy breakfast, start off with the morning in that way and just start with that. It's like a ripple. You're dropping the little rock. There's a, there's a Bruce Lee kind of thing where he, like when he was starting his thing, he dropped the rock and it hit and it has a rippling out effect. So you don't want to take it all on at once because that's most likely going to lead you to not actually be able to do it. And then you're going to wind up getting down on yourself. But to allow yourself to uh, take on, start, start at the level that you want to do, start in the morning and then just let it sort of ripple forward. And it may take on other things. And then just one other thing is just at night, you know, the, the nighttime ritual, like a one hour ritual. I generally say to my clients, use your five senses, create a kind of a spa like experience for yourself. What are the things you like to look at before that makes you give you E, whether it's art, whether it's certain like nature videos, they have all these funny animal videos that they have on there. Let's, you can watch the news in between, but during this time, let's give your body a chance to kind of destimulate itself. What are the smells that you like? Maybe you have an aromatherapy diffuser, lavender, you know, peppermint, whatever it is, rose. Uh, then you look at the certain taste, maybe some teas that you really enjoy uh, and, and that you can drink, you know, that would be delightful for you and sounds moving into like playlists and all those kind of things. So I think if you start with those kind of basic things and you could always go to my website at drmance.com. I, on my newsletter, if you sign up, it's free. Um, there's articles on there that I provide some of these kind of basic stuff with. I, it's one of the ways that people who can't see me directly uh, can gain access to information that would be helpful uh, and, and allows them to, because obviously we can't cover all the material in one talk here, but it will at least get, and I try to give it that it's not something that, it's not like being jammed down your throat. There's also always the emotional issue behind it. And that's one of the things I think that is lacking a lot in this kind of industry. And I think it's one of the things that I, obviously you and I uh, see as a, one of the most powerful vehicles to become familiar with and to utilize. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate all of this. And mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend. And uh, I think it'll be really valuable to our listeners. 
Well, and I appreciate this work that you do, Lisa. I think it's extraordinarily important and valuable. And it was my pleasure to use this hour to help you, help everyone else that maybe uh, may gets to listen to this. And and I hope that uh, whatever whatever you need, you know, any more help or anytime, I'd be sure to donate more time for this cause. Okay, great. Thanks All so right. much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.